Hello everyone, I'm Mr. Furlong, and today we're talking about organizing our data. An important skill in biology this year is how to properly organize our data. Data is something that we are surrounded in here in the 21st century. There's so much data being thrown at us and we have to be able to understand what it means. We have to be able to organize it properly. And that skill takes a while. So we're gonna take a look at how we do this. Primarily, we're going to be looking at organizing data in one of two ways. The first is the simplest, and that is simply by making a data table. Now, when we make a data table, it looks something like this. And there's a lot of information we can get from a table such as this. This table gives us quite a bit of data. What we're focusing on though is how this data is organized. So when we're making a data table, there's really just two rules that we need to follow. Rule number one is that we always have to include the headings. The table wouldn't make sense without them. So for instance, we have two headings. We have the name of some popular cereals like Cheerios, Corn Flakes, Frosted Mini Weeks, Lucky Charms, and Cocoa Puffs. And the other column tells us how much iron in milligrams is present in each. And we can see those numbers there. So we can get a couple of things immediately from this information. This was probably an experiment that looked at which types of cereals contained the most amount of iron. The other thing to notice is that all of our grid lines are present. So these grid lines are these lines that make up the top and the bottom and the sides. You know, these are all grid lines here. Make sure that you have all of them. For instance, some people in the past, they might just want to oh, we're gonna make a line here and a line here. And then they make their table and they got their data table made properly. And that, that's not going to cut it. Make sure that you have all of your grid lines present. All right, the other way that we can organize our data is by making graphs. There's lots of different types of graphs out there. We're going to focus on making three different types this year primarily. One is the line graph. How do we know when to make each of these different types of graphs? Well, it depends on our data. So for instance, we make a line graph when both of our variables, our independent and our dependent, are continuous. Now what does this word continuous mean? Well, basically, if your data is collected using numbers, then those are continuous variables. Let's take a look at the number of public high schools in the United States. And we take a look at how they have changed over time. So starting in 1980, all the way through 2010. Notice that our dependent variable, the number of public high schools, is a number. We simply counted how many there were. That's a continuous variable. The school year, right, that is also a continuous variable. Not only is it numbers, but it's also time. Time is always going to be a continuous variable. Now notice the bottom number for the number of high schools did not start at zero. If we started at zero, we could have made a graph like that, but it would look something like this. And so notice that we see a bigger change in that first graph than we do in the second one based on the scale that we were using. Is it okay to start our graphs not at zero? Certainly it is. Uh, you just have to really take a look at your data. Making a graph is an art form. You might not have thought about that before. You think about that science and a math type of a thing, not an art thing, but it really is. And so you really have to take a look at your data to see what is the best type of graph to make. Because when you're making graphs, you certainly don't want to mislead your audience. And so that's something that we'll be working on this year. Another type of graph is a bar graph. Now we're going to make a bar graph when one of the variables is discrete. So what does discrete mean? Well, let's take a look at uh, the most common mascot names in Ohio. So our dependent variable is a number, right? We simply count up how many schools there are. But our independent variable, the mascot name, that's a discrete variable. In other words, every school can fit into a particular category. It can't be in more than one. So for instance, in Ohio, the most common mascot name are the Eagles. 40 schools in Ohio have that as their mascot. In fact, the top five are shown. Eagles is number one, then the Panthers, the Tigers, the Wildcats and the Bulldogs. And I threw in the Knights in case you were wondering. There are 16 schools in the state of Ohio that have the Knights as their mascot. And then you can see the last one. That's the high school that I graduated from. I went to a small high school called Fremont St. Joe and we were the Crimson Streaks. 
An interesting fact about that particular mascot, not only are we the only Crimson Streaks in the state of Ohio, but we are also the only Crimson Streaks in the country. The third type of graph is a histogram. Now, a histogram is used when both variables are continuous. In other words, they're a number. Uh, but one of them can be categorized. So, for instance, here we have the breeding pairs of bald eagles in Ohio. Now, this data was taken from 1990 to 2003. And I did not include some of the data afterwards because after 2003, you can see that the numbers were getting fairly high. And the state of Ohio decided that they don't need to measure the breeding pairs annually anymore. So now they just do it every once in a while. But the number of breeding pairs, of course, is a number, so that's a continuous variable. Year is a time, which is also a continuous variable, but we can take time and break it up into categories. In this case, we broke it up into years. And so this histogram is kind of like a combination of a bar graph and a line graph. So we use bars to represent the data, but the difference is in a histogram, the bars touch one another. So by the bars touching one another, that shows us that the independent variable is continuous. Notice in the previous example, the bars did not touch one another. When they're discrete variables, we would not have those bars touching one another because they fall into a specific category. All right, so let's take a look at all three of these graphs. There are certain rules that we need to follow when making these graphs, and all three of these follow those rules. Number one is that we have a title for each one, so it tells the reader what this graph is representing. The second one is that each of our axes are labeled, both the X and the Y. It tells us what those numbers represent. On the Y axis is always going to be the dependent variable. So remember, the dependent variable is what we are measuring. That goes on the Y. On the X is the independent variable. This is what's different from our control group versus our experimental group. Notice that the units increase the same for each line. So we don't just willy-nilly set up these particular numbers. You can see in the top graph, each line goes up by 1,500. In the middle graph, on the bar graph, it only goes up by 5 each line. On the histogram, it goes up by 10. The increment for each line is always going to be the same. And lastly, we want to use up as much of the graph as possible. So if you're given a full page graph to make, don't make a tiny little graph. Make sure that you use up the whole graph because that can influence the size of your graph, can influence the reader into maybe making a wrong conclusion based on that data. So we're going to have quite a bit of practice with organizing our data. You're going to get very proficient at making tables and graphs this year. And I'll see you in class.